and take these back corners down some more too. So you're just taking down the corners just a little bit more. Just taking the them down a little bit more. This light coming from these two light, these two uh, lamps here are uh, soft boxes, and the light's really flat in comparison, so it's really hard to see any contrast. Okay, so now I'm ready to put the frog on. And we're going to check and see where we are with our camber and our graduations. So this string I'm using is actually a archery bow string. We have a business here in town that does um, outdoors guns and bows and all that hunting stuff. And so I've gone there and just grabbed, um, they've put a new bowstring, so they always have boxes full of these things. So I always grab a handful for students. And um, it's got a four millimeter peg that goes into the head. And then a little piece of um, angle bracket that goes behind the head or behind the frog with uh, leather on it. Um, you can also, if you want to, just go ahead and re and finish the frog and rehair it. Um, a lot of people think that's a bit more accurate than doing it this way, but so far we're it's working for me. So, so I'm just checking down the stick and see how close I am with my thicknesses versus my widths. So all pretty close down here. It's a little bit. A little bit tall and so I look down the stick and right now I have uh, this area is too stiff so I want to be able to draw the camber out evenly uh, so we have to take down this center section here so I'm just gonna just about make the bow straight and then this little plane fits in here really well Right now, that's where we're going. As we're, we're trying to get the um, all eight sides of this down to their final dimensions. So, as you're doing the height and width, you're also bringing those corners down too. Yep. The corners may not be the same dimension as the as the height or the width. Might be a little bit bigger bow really isn't round um, because the as the um, as the side facets go towards the head they slowly rotate to match the angle of the head so can't exactly make it uh, equal angle uh, or dimension um, octagon okay Looking good there. What are we doing here? I still got lots of lots of meat to take off here. When would you start weighing it to make sure that you have the right weight? Um, you can start doing that now. I know it's way overweight just because it's still way over dimensions. So this is still half a millimeter 
too big. This piece of wood was uh, had a specific gravity of 1.08, so I know that it's going to be a bow that is going to be sort of between being a um, uh, needing a silver wrap and needing a thread wrap, so I could kind of go either way with it. Six. Okay, I can start taking my sides down a little. Okay, we're still nice and straight here. Still to weigh, still too much meat here. Take these corners down. Imagine Tort working at his bench. So his uh, apartment was, uh, I think, on the fifth floor. Um, it was right on the Seine River in Paris. He um, um, there probably weren't any trees that were tall enough to block any light coming through his windows. Um, the windows faced mostly south, a little bit west. And uh, I can imagine him sitting at his bench with that sun pouring in and either scooting one way or the other to be out of the direct light or sort of hopping his chair down his bench as the sun moved across the sky. It must have been a challenge for those guys to see stuff as well as we do with the bench light. think that competition has made people be a lot a lot uh, uh, more accurate makers maybe and probably in the last 30 year years 30 40 years it's been a lot easier to be a maker you can actually make a living when back in the first half of the um, 20th century probably wasn't as easy. Do you think that's because communication gotten easier with internet and telephones? And no, that phenomenon happened long before the internet. Okay, still pretty stiff right in the middle here, and then I know we're still quite a bit oversized. Take a few swipes off of the top.
corners on here and then we'll weigh it and see where we are. Side's plenty good enough. How often do you want to check and make sure you have a decanter while you're playing? Yeah, um, every time you remove a uh, you know portion of wood, you're you have the potential <coughs> to change the camber. So. <coughs> you have to check that. So we're going to go ahead and pull this off. Weigh it. Uh, Sean O. Fairdale asked, would the old French makers have <coughs> a bow in their hands? rather than using a tensioner, or has it always been around? Well, we don't really know, unfortunately. Um, this method of, of cabling is really more of a, probably of an English thing than a French thing. So um, um, they may have put their hair, put hair in it, but you've got, you know, I the first, few hundred bows I made I was just flexing them like this to see and you could get a lot of information but not enough information not to make a really well refined bow so um, so anyway so we're back here at the scale so right now the bow weighs 59 grams so if you add hair that's another five grams that makes it 64 and then the the, about the lightest thumb grip and wrap you can put on it would be about a millimeter and a half. So we would be up at um, 65 and a half grams. So obviously that's, that's heavy. Um, when you round it, you lose about uh, three grams. So that would bring it down to about 63-ish grams. So that's still on the heavy side. Um, and it was, and it would be definitely um, heavy at the head too. So, um, so we're gonna keep going. This thing is real strong still. So we can we can uh, make it a little bit smaller. So we'll keep going. Sixty grams is would be my sort of. I guess I can leave that on. My my sort of set goal weight. Put that on, we'll check and see how we're doing with our camber. It all looks good. And we could put a little bit more here. And maybe lose just a little bit here. We're talking about teeny tiny amounts here. So one of the really kind of fun things over the years, um, doing the bow making things at Oberlin and the Violin Society is I've met some really amazing um, inventive people. One of them is uh, Norman Pickering, um, who passed away about four or five years ago. And um, if, you, uh, if you played records in your youth, 
um, you might have wanted to have a Pickering stylus for your record player. And that was one of his inventions. And I remember talking to him one day, and he's had many, many, many inventions and patents. And he said, he said, nah, none of my inventions really amounted to much, except for one. He said, I was asked by a hospital to see if we could take um, sound waves to make medical images. And he invented ultrasound which is pretty amazing. And then another guy who took uh, one of the bow making classes up at Oberlin, um, lived in Corning, New York, and worked for Corning. And he had this little project, he and I think four or five other guys for Corning engineers, and they came up with the process of adhering platinum to ceramic, I think is right. And his group um, basically in, uh, made the catalytic converter work. Well, that's pretty cool. He said, uh, this is years ago, he said, um, Corning is working on their second billion dollars in profit off of that little invention. And then another guy, um, Joe Reg, who's a violin maker and a bow maker, he worked for IBM, I think, and he has like the first 25 patents in semiconductors. So like every phone or basically any electronic device today has something in it that he's invented. So that's pretty cool. One of the guys that I think he went over to the violin making side a few times. It was an astronomer, right? Yeah. So there's a guy who's listening right now who's pretty famous in his own right that uh, got to play around with viruses. So I wonder what he thinks of all of this stuff that's going on right now. Maybe he'll chime in. Straightening? Nah. Nope. He's retired. So we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. We want to make sure we are as straight as we possibly can be. Okay, here we go. Tony asked, um, how much weight will you lose once you carve? the chamfers and finish the mortise in the head? So rounding the stick and finishing the head, doing the, the mortise in the head, overall you're losing about three grams. And I, I can't imagine you're gonna lose two tenths more or less than that. Shaping the, finishing shaping the frog, you're gonna lose maybe a tenth. So we're talking about pretty tiny amounts. Um, probably not going to affect it too much. Ed Shilato said scary. Scary. Viruses are, this stuff is scary, yeah. Oh, I don't know if he was talking, is that who we were talking about? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Oh. I didn't know you did that, Ed. Yep. So, yeah, pretty another amazing person I got to know doing my bow work here is Ed Shilato. All right, let that cool down. And maybe we can finish here. Let's see what this height is. Okay, we can take some down off of the, the width of the head. So I'm, I'm just planing 
the stick and very little of the head here. So here's a here's a question for you, Ed. Do you think that this virus is was manipulated by a man's hand, or was it a natural, just naturally made its way into the human population? It's a scary question. This kind of important here on the the uh, head. Um, I think that the reason that it's narrower here than it is taller is that as you play closer to the head you need a little bit more flexibility. You need the bow to flex a little bit here to kind of hold contact with the string. So bows that are kind of clunky up here, that's really one of the things that where they kind of fall down a little bit is they're, they're kind of lose contact a bit. Ed said it's natural. He's looked at the DNA sequence and there's nothing strange in it. No, that's reassuring, I hope. Suggested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, take the height down. I'm going to give Wesley a COVID 19 haircut this weekend. Yeah. Would you like one also? Oh, uh, I don't know. Maybe. I feel like I'm going to have a ponytail by the end of this uh, next month. Uh, Charles asked, are you still keeping an octagon? Yes. For right now, till you're finished with the graduations? From here to the bitter end. So when yeah, it's, it's finished, it's going to be octagonal? It's going to be octagonal. Well, the bow will be round. Or it'll be really small. The dimensions will have to be small. So I'd rather make this round. So we're going to do this again tomorrow. Are we? Are we? Well, I'm asking. Um, yeah, I think we'll, f we'll finish up the stick tomorrow. There's probably about two and a half hours worth of work um, once we get the um, final planing here. So rounding the stick and uh, doing the chamfer. And I, what I would like to be able to do is uh, get some polish on the stick and let it sit 
for a couple of days to get nice and hard and then we can we'll be able to take Sunday off and then Monday start uh, finish the frog and then maybe we can put it all together on uh, on Tuesday oops oh, you me. yeah okay we got that finished took it a little bit more corners on here All right, that, well, that looks pretty good. Tyler asked, when you're measuring the width right behind the head, are you still measuring the middle height of it? Yeah, so when I put my, when I put my calipers on to measure the width, this way I put them right there, right in the middle of that, that mass, I guess. Because I don't really, I don't have these lower corner facets done yet. I just don't. I just think that's kind of the best way to get that measurement. All right, let's put it under tension again. And see what we got. I saw a cat. It's not ours. We don't have a cat. Uh, Tony said so. It takes about fifteen hours for you to make a bow. <laughs> Um, now, I mean, this will be interesting. It'll be, it'll pretty much show the timing of doing this. Um, this is also going to kind of, uh, kill the myth that these French makers were making five bows a week. Yeah, you can see so much of this. There's just no way to do this any faster. Um, Without losing, and they didn't have they didn't have a little drill press or a milling machine. So yeah, maybe shops were making that many bows, but you can you can pretty much say, you know, it took. Pretty much one person per bow. Maybe if you had five guys in the shop, you might have been able to make six bows. Because if you were just doing repetitive things, you could um, you could do it a little faster. But they might have worked a little faster because they weren't they weren't such a slave to these things. They have little um, little gauges that they use instead. That's a little too much. Yeah. So we're going to take a break from filming on Sunday. Yes. And that way everybody has one day to catch up. Yeah, and if you know anybody who would be interested in, um, in buying this bow, um, again, it's the proceeds of this sale of this bow are going to go to Samaritan's Purse in honor of the work that they're doing in Cremona, Italy right now. They're in Cremona and Milan, and they just set up a field hospital in New York City, too. Yeah. This plane's not cooperating today. Andrew Nowicki asked, 
um, any idea how much um, you'll be asking for the bow? Yeah, my my standard price on these bows is six thousand five hundred dollars. So, so if we this could, isn't going to be a special. No, this is just going to be straight price on this. Okay, that's good. Still a little thick. We have friends um, who uh, have a uh, business where they make uh, brand stamps. And um, we talked to them this morning about the idea of having a, a brand made up to brand this bow with uh, something, maybe COVID-19 or C-19 or something, and just sort of to commemorate what it's about. And then we want to offer that brand to anybody else who's doing a project like this um, so that they could also um, brand them or stamp it as well. Boy, this is super close. Still just a little bit too strong right here in the middle. If I don't know if you can see this. So you can see this is pretty flat has a little bit of curve here and then it kind of comes over a little bit right there behind the head. So we still have to reduce this a little bit, but super close. Tyler said, uh, I bet Tony will have a bow made the first day he's back in the shop. Just <laughs> one, I'm thinking maybe three. Tony, you may want to check. I know that you're concerned about going to your shop, but I think as long as you're not seeing customers and it's your own shop, I think you you can go and be in that space. I know a lot of people around here that have businesses are concerned about um, Loot. looting. And so some of the businesses, I know David Werther at his museum is really concerned that, um, you know, even if they just went in with a baseball bat and had a little fun, uh, you know, how devastating that would be. So. Now you're going to make them paranoid. <laughs> well, I think you've got, I think you do have a right to be able to protect your own, um, your own space. So. They just don't want people being in the same space with each other. Still, still a little strong in here. So I'm going to put a pencil mark here. So from about there to about there. So let's see. Be about eight here. It's seven nine, still a little, little wide. Uh, Sean asked, uh, "Have you experimented with different cameras over the years? More pronounced or less, or found one you like and stuck with it?" Yeah, we talked a little bit about this uh, on the very first. Um, installment so um, you're limited to the curve by a couple of things one of them is um, the height of the frog the height of the head 
the weight of the material, the strength of the material. You could have an unlimited number of cambers. You could even do this if you wanted to, as long as your thicknesses um, corresponded with those. The thing is, is that the player, when the player plays it, they hold it here. So the balance, um, you can't have a lot of material out here. Um, you know, so that's going to limit a lot of cambers. Um, you want, when you play the bow, you want to be able to draw an even tone out of the bow as you go from frog to head. If the player has to do a lot of things with their hand to try to achieve that, then that's not a, that's not a successful bow. So if you looked at bows from Tort all the way to Sartori, so separate them by a hundred years. If you just looked at them, you really wouldn't see that much difference, but they are quite different in that Tort bow is at its thinnest behind the head, at its thickest at the butt, and it has a... Um, a gradual taper all the way to the butt and that's what we're doing here today the sartori would be the thinnest at the butt of, at the behind the head of course the thickest spot would be right there and then it would be about a half a millimeter thinner at the butt of the stick picot who's sort of in the middle of there his bows get um they taper till they get to about here. Again, this is one this one third from the butt. And then they're basically the same thickness through the butt of the stick. So those are really the two most, or three most different uh, cambers. There are gonna be little variations on that because you're gonna have, you know, some, you know, a piece of wood that's a little stronger at one area or another. But um, I would say those, those are the most successful um, cambers. So you have spent a lot of time listening to players and their comments on the playability of their bow. Um, are there any, is there anything you can tell them about that? Maybe when a when a player says there's a dead spot or it doesn't bounce or typically when there's a spot where you kind of lose the sound quality of the bow or they've got to press hard or whatever the defect is directly above that spot so if somebody says well it's really not catching here it's really not sounding good there chances are there's either too much or not enough camber in that exact spot it's really you know how the violin knows that there's a, a defect in the bow at that spot, I have no idea, but that's sort of what we see. And I've talked to a lot of players, a lot of makers, and they absolutely agree with that idea. Okay, so let's check the camera one more time. See what we have here. take just a little bit out here and I'm going to probably heat this up about three different places. This is where the bow is a little bit too stiff right now anyways 
So we're gonna lose a little camber here. better. And then we get to add it up here for some reason. Sometimes when you plane it, the camber kind of falls out of the spot. So we just have to keep pecking away at it here. some of this finishing work that we have we can break it up over several days so we're not doing three hours a day we might might have to sometimes you just you can't do it all and you gotta put polish on let it sit so that kind of stuff so we'll see how it goes but we should be done with this probably by Wednesday I would think as in wrap, thumb grip, branded. Ready to brand. Looking good here. Okay, while well, that's cooling down, let's check and see what our weight is. Fifty three point six. So if we add, we take away three grams, we get to fifty point six. That would be for rounding it, and then we would add our um, hair. hair, and that would bring it back to fifty five point six. And so then we could put a silver winding on it. It would be. 50, uh, 60.6, which would be great. Perfect. So we're done with the graduations. Yeah, well, I'm going to check and make sure my camber's good, but I would say we're pretty much done with um, all the planing. So we are at 43 minutes. Well, we're still a little ways. we got. I got to check, check, and recheck everything here before we're done. I've got still got a little bit of um, got to even up these um, top two chamfers back here so we'll do that right now Jack asked uh, which zone of the bow is the lowest point of the camber or is it dependent on the model yeah I wouldn't even think about that because um, you know trying to say oh it should be here it should be here What's more important is when you when you draw it up, does the camber come all the way out? The only bow that that doesn't work for is a Sartori, and and basically there'd be about this much of the camber that doesn't come all the way out when you tighten it up. So yeah, don't think about where the low point is. Um, it's it that just that depends on whatever your curve is so
always nice when these two chamfers are basically the same size. You look down them and see how nice and straight they are. Okay, that's pretty good. Okay, we're, we're cool enough now. We can check our camber. You were just waiting for it to cool down so you didn't pull the camber out of it when you... Right. So we were super close before we readjusted the camber there a bit. I'm going to say that is, that is finished. And that's really nice and straight. When, if it's straight when you pull it up this tight, uh, then it's going to be really nice and straight when it's only at playing tension. So somewhere around there, it's going to have a nice bounce to it. All right, that'll do it. So tomorrow we'll go ahead and finish the bow and start putting polish on it. And um, yeah, and then we'll great. Take a day break, and then we'll take Sunday off and then hit it hard on uh, Monday. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. We'll see you tomorrow.